And as I said to you before, when you live in a burning house, mm. if you think everything around you is normal. But then years later, you discover that wasn't a normal childhood. That wasn't a normal uh, perception of life. Everything that happened to, you know, to to me as a, as a child growing up. And why I say me is because although we're 10 children, every single one of us lived a different childhood. Their recollect their memories of the what happened or what, you know, what circumstances they lived in was very different to my perception or recognition of what happened. I never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Turn around. Hi, folks. Welcome back to Neff Inspiration, my show on YouTube and as a podcast. Today is a fantastic day for an interview, and it's it will be a very intriguing and interesting interview because I've got Mariam Elhuli with me. Mariam is a woman who found herself in free wars, as you do, because, you know, our life is otherwise boring. And what else could you do? At, oh, yeah, let's have five children. I know that. And let's try to reinvent yourself uh, on a shoestring and try to make the most out of this world against all odds, against all the challenges that life decides to throw in front of you. And when I heard that story, I thought, okay, I need to speak to this woman because Mariam clearly has had to learn a few lessons the hard way. So, Mariam, welcome to my show. Thank you so much, Stephen. What a wonderful introduction. Yes, and as you said, uh, otherwise life becomes boring if we don't have a bit of excitement in our lives. <laughs> and I'm sure um, that whoever runs this this universe i'm sure there's a meeting every week and they look at all of us and they look at hey mariam look at her down there she seems to get her shit together hmm let's see what else we can throw at her have you had this feeling that this was happening to you in the past it's still happening i don't think it's ever stopped I think the day I was born, it was written for me that I am not going to have a straight line of a life. It's going to be adventures and tsunamis and storms. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> and for for those of us who uh, wander free wars, and I hear a bit of an Australian accent, how did you do that? <laughs> so the tell us a bit about your I won, the, I won the war lotto. <laughs> how do you do that? Basically, you know, I'm going to give you a long story, short version. I decided, and there's a lot of background reasons why, that at the age of 15, I was going to get married, although I was an A student. But I think sometimes life, or you think at 15 that you you run the world and you run the show and, and you know, you have competence more than any adult on this planet. So, you know, Anyway, the reasons were what they were, and I decided that I was going to go overseas and get married and live there with my husband. And at 16, I had my oldest son, Yosef, and I was living in Lebanon when the first um, experience, let's say, with war, which was quite, you know, in hindsight, as I've gotten older, I've realized the impact it's had on me. Um, and I got up, I got caught up in a 2006 Lebanon-Israel war and was evacuated with the help of the government via, via boats to Cyprus. You were trying to leave a mark there, and and obviously these these were your beliefs. Um, have are you from Lebanese ancestry? Yes, we are. We are Perfect. Lebanese. Perfect. And uh, I guess marriages do occur early there, so it's a societal um, kind of um, development, isn't it? No, not, not really. Not not in not twenty years ago. It wasn't thirty, forty years ago. Yes, it was the norm. But when I decided right. to take that step, it wasn't. It was not unheard of, but it wasn't the common thing anymore. It was a shock to oh. everyone, actually. Ah, okay. And it's so it's so strange because Lebanon nowadays, um, people who are younger will only link Lebanon with either civil war or disastrous destruction or uh, constant friction with Israel and incursions with Hezbollah. There's nothing nice to Lebanon. Yet Lebanon once was like the Riviera in France, uh, as yeah. far as the Eastern Mediterranean was concerned. It was a very liberal, a very beautiful place to be. Um, so 
we need to see that this was actually an amazing place prior to the 80s when increasing civil war started to rip the country apart. And unfortunately, this has only continued with an increasing amount of uh, extreme forces placing themselves within the uh, within Lebanon and therefore tainting, I guess, the image and the the, the nowadays the impression that we have got from Lebanon. When you the went, Lebanon, Lebanon. Sorry, just to tell you, Lebanon was called the Swiss of the East. Exactly. It was if people just did a one second Google search and checked the seventies. It was, as you said, it was people from France all around the world would come because of the Mediterranean uh, weather that they had. But then the the Swiss-like Alps sort of mountains, and it it is still a beautiful country. Mm. Once we, you know, you know, bin the politicians, <laughs> people, it is it, it is absolutely beautiful. But as you said, which country does politics not get involved in, and war comes in, it doesn't leave in one piece. I don't I don't think any country is left on earth that had was is what it was once upon a time mm. here you were 16 um and suddenly uh a major uh, incursion occurs a major friction occurs a war incurs how did you cope how... as, any child, as any child would co literally now i say this but back then i thought i was as i said i was you know unstoppable uh, I, I just thought this was not not fun but this is very interesting this is like a movie uh, you know this is um oh what's happening oh so, uh, you know but coming from australia never seeing a gun in my life to seeing army tanks and the the army themselves and and everything and not, you know everything that happens with the war I don't think in my mind it registered. I'm like, okay, we just have a situation. Oh, well, we need to evacuate. Oh, well, oh, well. it was just this, oh, let's just get things done. I don't think I realized what I went through maybe 10 years later. And I'm like, oh, hang on, let's stop here and 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 reflect on this. This is not a normal experience for a 16 year old. But then I thought to myself, well, Mariam, what normal have you had? If you had a child at 16, is that normal? Uh -huh. So I don't think it's normal for you. Okay. Oh, I love that. I love that. And, but it is so normal that we actually normalize. I think we need to find a new word. I think we're using that far too much. <laughs> isn't it, uh, isn't it strange how we incorporate the most chaotic scenes? Because for us, that's reality and reality is normal. Um, so often we don't have a yardstick to compare it to. And that is what, what I hear from so many of my guests who are who have gone through horrendous childhoods. And they, for them, yeah, that was normal. And of course, they developed their maybe not so great coping mechanisms uh, as a direct response. Now, you could say to a certain degree, you were lucky because this was occurring at the time of when you were 16, so as a teenager, rather than when you were, let's say, four or five, when really core beliefs uh, can be really screwed up big time. Um, but even as 16, you have no idea about life. Um, how close did the war come to your family? We were we were in the north part of uh, Lebanon, so we were not on the direct for, forefront of it. But you still heard the planes. You still heard um, because there was bombings of the the infrastructure that was still there. I remember uh, you know going up to the balcony and watching. They had some sort of um, it was like missiles being thrown next to the next to the mountain we had because there was a big uh bridge you still have there was still fear and panic and people hoarding food just as you'd see in a movie and to tell you something which is now funny but back then I thought nothing of it and my late father called me and said Mariam you need to go and because I've experienced war the true war for years growing up he said you need to go and start hoarding formula for your son and nappies mm -hmm. and I'm like well, what for he goes because we don't know how long this is going to last mm -hmm. and your son is bottle fed you will have no milk and no one will care it's each person for themselves so I remember he sent me money and he said as many tins as you can now I went to the shopping centers and and the thing started as my father said but you know what I was interested in how am I going to get fabric softener for the for the washing machine <laughs> See, 
I mean, that shows the 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 well, every, absolutely. Well, everyone was buying, yeah, well, everyone was buying um, flour and salt and, and yeast. And I bought formula and everything. But I was also asking, you know, the attendants, do you have a fabric softener? And they're just looking, are you an idiot? Are you an idiot? <laughs> what softener are you looking for? We we just started a war. There is no electricity. There is like... And I couldn't understand these people. It's like, you know, when you see the films, the, the Maria Antoinette said to them, why don't you have biscuits? We're starving. Like, this is literally what I did. But again, that's from ill experience and just thinking this might be just, you know, nothing. But it, it was very serious. But I just remember that I wanted to share with you that how a child's perspective, no matter how much they think they understand the world, you don't understand anything at 16. Oh, Many 16-year-olds will disagree <laughs> and many 20-year-olds still. But oh. I think it is a wonderful insight. But uh, intriguingly, you said you only had that insight 10 years later in your late 20s. Right. So, you, But you were lucky because you had come from Australia. Uh, you had Australian passports. You were able to be uh, to be taken out of Lebanon to Cyprus, you mentioned. And then did you return back to uh, to Australia? Oh, yes, we became, uh, and you know you know what, what that war also taught me? I think that's when the wake up call is. When we went from Tripoli to Beirut to the port, because we only had an hour to get there with nothing on our backs. Nothing, you could take nothing, only a tiny, tiny bag of two pieces of clothes and some nappies for your child that, And as we were going to the port, there were thousands of people lined. This is when it started to hit me. Thousands of people lined up in the dead city of Beirut. It was the city of the dead. Every smoke and it was just horrible. That the color of your passport determined if you were humanly enough to worthy of being saved. Like I could not believe people lining up at embassies, people in the roads. And just because my color of the passport was blue, it was foreign, that I was deemed worthy of saving and everyone else can go to hell. So I, I think that's when the, the injustice of the world hit me or started to. It was the beginning for me, really, to think differently. You had probably with your husband tried to build up a business, tried to build up a, a source of income. What happened to that? We had a little, now this is again, this is the love struck. My husband was 19, as my mother put it then back in the days, and she was against this marriage completely. She said two children are going to have a child and start something is just insane. But I was very rebellious from day zero, I think, from a lot of reasons, you know, growing up in a burning house, you think everything, as you said, is normal. Um, we had a little uh, you know, like a little pizza shop. We have Lebanese, it's called Manaish. It's like a little zata, little pitters and cheese, pay, you know, which my father gave me a couple of hundred dollars to open up. Um, we just left it. It was, looking back, I don't think, it, there was no one isn't even a business. I think it was just a little side, side, side hustle. But we we left, we left everything, you know, the, even the house I had rented, our furniture, our clothes, hmm. everything other than my photo album, I took nothing. Did you later go back? Um, a few years later, we went back. Yes, mm. uh, I think two or three years later, mm. uh, we did go back. But the, everything was, you know, thrown out or packed off, or my in-laws sold, or I don't know what they did with it. I, I never asked. I was just grateful that we got out of there mm. um, with the least possible, I think, damage to our psyches. I was just that my son and my husband and we were safe. Mm. Um, and you know, home for me was always going to be Australia. That's where I was born and raised mm. in. Mm. Um, and, and we just went back home to my family. Which, of course, is beautiful. And uh, it, family is such a strong support if you have it. But so many so many people don't have it. Uh, so many no. people have very dysfunctional families. Unfortunately, yes. And uh, still, uh, for children to return home can be quite a strain on the parents. Was that happening with hindsight? Oh, absolutely. It was it was a huge strain. I came back with an extra two people, two humans with me in a house that's already overflowing. I'm the oldest out of 10 kids. Mm. So if I was 17 then, you imagine the youngest was – my youngest sister is 10 months older than my own son, my oldest. Okay. So there was already mum, dad, nine other children – the aunties, everyone that's had a fight with her husband lived at my dad's house. We were literally like, 
like the you know the Salvation Army, if you want, for for all the communities homeless. I don't know what it was, but my father was the oldest, uh, and his nieces and nephews that were married. You know, like any ethnic families, if there's a problem, you go to your uncle's house. So we were always having these constant guests that you never knew who was next there. Oh it was my huge. goodness. And I left, I couldn't stay more than a month. And that's when, you know, life really started to give me some nice laps and say, you know, you chose this life. Well, now you're going to have to, you know, leave the consequences of it. But how do you do that? How do you create a life from nothing? Well, when you've come from nothing, nothing is normal, Stephen. Okay. When zero is always zero for you, Going back, going from one to zero is just like a trip. That's a beautiful abstract thought. But what did you do? I just, you know, I think I swallowed my pride and and because I was so stubborn and because I wanted to prove everyone that I had made the right decision at that age, I wasn't going to give anyone, just like any teen, rebel teenager, except with with really higher stakes. I said, you know what, we're going to make this work and we're going to go find work and we're going to, you know, my husband was just out of school. I, I had dropped out of school. I had did a bit of nursing, but I didn't want to work um, in that field. And he, he he was just 19 out of school. So he went and f- found a job in construction, which he's still in, 20 years later. And I helped him. I remember I worked at a meat place at a deli for the first month because we needed to buy nappies and stuff while he found work. And he spoke no English, by the way. Oh. So that that was another so nineteen year old no English out of school in a new country, um, it was just I don't know you know if my daughter was to do that I think I'll I'll kill her like <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly I what you're saying I, you know and but it, that's that's exactly what we did we just I don't know I think is it's when you have a when you want to prove everyone wrong you will do anything and suck it up to make it work. What were the lessons that you learned with hindsight from that time? Oh, so, so so I don't I don't think I can ever count them. I learned so much, but I've rediscovered myself. Everything that I thought I knew to be true, it wasn't. It was just in my mind, in my perspective. As you say, in hindsight, looking, I think the reason was for I didn't want to go back to living with my parents. For you to understand some concept, my father, uh, my late father, he passed away now. You know, over 13 years ago, he had he was a schizophrenic, so he had a severe mental health issue, which we never, as a community, as a as as a household, never spoke about. And I can go into hours about you know the, the replications of living with someone with a severe mental health disorder that doesn't even acknowledge that they've got that, and 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 the trauma and 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 everything that happened in that time. And then he developed cancer in his 30s and passed away at 52. So that in its own, it was a factor for me that we, I made this decision because I'm not going there. And as I said to you before, when you live in a burning house, mm-hmm. if you think everything around you is normal. Mm-hmm. But then years later, you discover that wasn't a normal childhood. That wasn't a normal uh, perception of life. Everything that happened to, you know, to, to me as a, as a child growing up. And why I say me is because... Although we're 10 children, every single one of us lived a different childhood. Their recollect their memories of the what happened or what you know what circumstances they lived in was very different to my perception or recognition of what happened. So that, that's what that's to put you give you a bit of context and to your viewers as why would someone go down that line? Because to me, that was the better option of what I had. Now, in reality, as as a 35-year-old mother of five now who has teen kids, adult kids, my son's nearly 19, what did I learn? I learned nothing. I learned nothing from that time because I was still a child and I carried the burden of trauma. So every decision I made in my life then was wrong in hindsight now. If I could redo my life, things would be completely different. But I thought there was no option out. And when you when you hit a wall and you think that there is no future and there's no hope and there's no tomorrow, is it was it really a choice? And this is what I always ask myself: Did I really have a choice? What choices did I have? There wasn't any choices. Hmm. And and that, I think that's that's how I've come to a conclusion that no, I didn't have a choice really. And that's beautifully said. 
that's wonderfully said because you had to think about your survival and rightly or wrongly so you make decisions based upon the facts as you see them based upon the emotions based upon the core beliefs that were laid down in your early childhood all that comes together to drive you to make a certain decision now for some of us that is trying to escape the reality for example trying to throw ourselves into alcohol or throwing ourselves into gambling, drugs, cocaine, mm -hmm. food, um, social media nowadays, scrolling for hours. Um, were there temptations as such for you? No, all, for me, all I wanted was to live a life that I never got to choose to live. I didn't want to live paycheck to paycheck. I didn't want to live um, you know, in a house that's overcrowded. I didn't want to, so I, I just wanted to escape. I didn't want rules. Um, I didn't want, and, and I, and I thought then, you know, they were unfairly put on me, you know, like any teen, like any parent, I, I, I just wanted to live opposite of my parents' belief. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Stephen, I don't know if you found that as you've grown older, but you say that, you know, for you, maybe your dad, but for me, for my mum, I always used to tell her, I will never be you. And I don't want to be you. Although my mother's, you know, my mother's an amazing woman. She's got a superhero story of herself, but as I've gotten older, I found I am becoming my mother in a lot of ways. <laughs> Is that upsetting to you? Sometimes it's, it makes me very, and I told her the other day, I go, you know what? It makes me angry that I see a lot of what you said now to be truth. <laughs> when before I, I would absolutely refuse it. But now with my own kids, I find them, you know, I'm, I look at myself and I say, oh my God, I'm becoming my mother. I'm not my mother. <laughs> but, no, you are you, but the there are so many truths out there that remain true regardless Absolutely. what the generations are going through regardless what uh, certain beliefs in society certain vogue certain trends want to make us believe certain advertisements uh, try to tempt us to think in a different way when in reality there are certain kind of basics when you adhere to them and try to live your life according to them such as integrity authenticity humility yes. uh, yes. all those kind of beautiful beautiful things uh, wow our life can be amazing but often enough we are so blinded by other things but i mean here you were how where did the joy come from so far, your life has been full of struggle. Where did you find the laughter? Where did you find the smile that is creeping up on your face that is irresistible? Thank you so much. Look, I, I found that with my sisters, my family, once I had left the house, so once I had left the house and came as a visitor, I no longer abided by them rules. So I was much closer to them all. Uh -huh. Because I, it was like as if an internal unspoken dialogue was this. I am married. I've got my own life. I am now coming as your daughter with your, your you know, with my husband and child as a guest. Your yeah. rule, your life, your whatever's happening to you does does not concern me. You know, put two brackets around it. Of course, the family are always concerned about each other. But as if that bubble formed that I am me and you are you. And once we got to that stage the fight stopped, the misunderstanding stopped, uh, boundaries, although very little, were put in. I think, think a lot of things changed for me that once I had, you know, got them married. Interesting. Interesting, because it took the pressure off you, um, the, the fact that in your beliefs you couldn't get out. You were in a prison right. at right. home. And yeah. now you were in a prison of your own choice. Ta -da! Absolutely, yes. <laughs> but it yes, was your absolutely. own choice, wasn't it? Absolutely. That, that, I think that was what made a difference. Mm. Uh, no, and I'm not saying whether this is right or wrong. This is a this is a 17 year old child thinking. You know, take it into context of how much could have they understood. But then, as well, you have to understand when age doesn't mean anything, because it depends on what you've been through. You know, like my, I've, I've got my oldest is a 19 and the other 16. They are nowhere near as, um, you know, alert to this world as I was when I was, you know, 19 with two children. By then I had two kids. 
because they haven't lived through the circumstances that I lived in. So it's unfair to say that they're not wise. It's not that they're not wise. It's the the circumstances and the the lived experiences differ. Mm. Hence why if you pluck out a child out of a very severe war-torn country that's six, has more insights and knowledge and compassion and understanding of reality than a 30-year-old that's probably living in a five-star house with you know every beck and call being laid at them. If they haven't experienced the real life, if that makes sense. Very much so, and I 100% agree. And I think that is where so many of us who guests who are on this show, and myself included, we are actually grateful for the challenges that life has thrown mm-hmm. at us. And it's very, very rare if I offer someone to take a time machine and go back to change everything in their life. Very few people would actually take that offer uh, because they realize that nowadays the post-traumatic growth or the thriving that is in there, they're yearning for the light uh, is so strong because they have been mm-hmm. in the darkness. So therefore, I think this is a repeating theme. And I often joke nowadays, uh, how would it be to actually grow through joy? I would like to try that one day rather than grow through trauma and more upset and more tears and more. Ah. Take me with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Take me so, with you. If, if we could. Yeah, oh, look. Yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I think I think the the essence of our, you know, I don't want to keep using the word trauma. I think it's overused now, and and people make excuses of it not to live life. I don't like the use of the that word a lot. But I'm just, let's say the struggles of life, or what's life put us in. Or at least for me, I feel like I've been thrown in, you know, into the deep end the day I was born, and until now, I you know I identify as a lost soul trying to navigate the ocean depths. I don't think I've still found myself. Because every day I discover the yesterday's Mariam is not the same Mariam that she is today. And is that not a privilege? Is that not a wonderful, wonderful gift when you actually start living like that? Because you live with intention. And that is the amazing thing. So how does today's Mariam uh, differ from, let's say, 10 years ago? We don't need to go as far back now, uh, but you're, there were a lot of further circumstances and further trauma and further challenges, however you want to label them. How is nowadays, Miriam, different? What were the hard lessons you have learned? Or what were the, the, the privileged insights that you gained? Well, let's start off with by saying I'm a recovering doormat. I, 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 I yeah, that's that's the terminology I've come up with. <laughs> I am a recovering doormat. And I only discovered this this year, actually, that I was a doormat all my life to everyone. Um, and I'm a reco- I, I no longer identify as a doormat. That's that's the biggest change in me, I think. Um, and I think the the other one or the biggest one also would be that I've learned never to become the rescuer. I'm no longer the rescuer in everyone's life because the rescuer is the first person that's forgotten. And I can swear and put my hand over my heart and tell you that is an absolute truth. For anyone listening, for anyone watching, you do not have to rescue every single soul that you meet on this planet. That's not your job. Because as soon as that person recovers, you're the first person forgotten. So I am no longer that. That that's the biggest difference. Let's Ooh. start with those. Ooh, wow. Okay. Now I hundred percent agree. Um, I was there for everyone. Talk about people pleasing. Talk about external validation. Talk yeah. about you know. But then, oh wow, words so true to be spoken on this show. Yes, but well, we started um, with that. And then to tell you how I differed, 10 years ago, I graduated. So during my life, after I, you know, started to pick up myself and I went back to university and obtained a Bachelor of Literature Composition. Um, It took me 10 years, but you know what, who's counting? Who cares? 10 years, 10 years. It was between five kids. I always had, after all these wars and everything that I've been through, my outlet for me was writing. It still is. Um, So I did that. And then many failed businesses along the way. Because remember, the 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 whole point of me not living what I lived in my childhood was the biggest drive. Sometimes to the point of 
stupidity because you're always running after, you know, as I said to you before, I'm not my mother. I'm not their life. I'm not, I'm not. So you always try, it's like you're, you're following a ghost of I'm running away from it. I, I'm not used. And even if I was wrong, um, I'm not used. So it was just this fear of, okay, I'm going to fail in everything. And then I'm going to become exactly what you, or, you know, as my family, or I mean, you, my family, it was, so that was my always my biggest fear. Now so much as I've grown older, I've differentiated. You know, even if my mom was right in some things, I need to start to understand that, as you said, sometimes we just have to accept the basics. Um, you know, I'm very different. I became a director. I went to film school last year, put myself through that. I want to do my own uh, movies with my book, The Olive Tree, that I wrote. I'm... I'm a completely different person than I was last month. I'm not going to even go 10 years. Um, everything I've believed in before, I've sort of re, not reinvented, but had a look at all the fine details of my life. Um, I think COVID played the biggest strong, you know, the biggest um, awakening for me. I, I went through a phase of mega depression. As you know, Stephen, Australia was the one of the worst lockdowns we had here in Melbourne at least for two years um and then I thought to myself you know if a pandemic can come out of nowhere and put people in a prison in their own homes how fragile and we had been you know, a family that I knew passed away from the disease how and I thought to myself then how fragile is life and then after my father had passed away you know I I sort of went into another shock uh because I felt and I don't know if you would agree that I wish I had done more because he, of his mental illness. We weren't as close, or at least I wasn't as close to him. So the regrets of not doing more, but I was only 21. I was a mother of three at 21. Uh, I say to myself now, well, how much could have you known? And this is why I speak so, so much now on mental health because I lived it. I was a child that lived this. And I say to myself, had we known how to help my father, how much of a better relationship could we have had? How much of a life, of a better quality of life could he have had? I think he died misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And I and I sort of sat here heartbroken that, um, you know, a lot could have done for him. So those 10 years, I think, have, have changed me completely. And everyone around me says the same thing. They say, but Mariam, you're not, as if it's, as if it's a sin, as if changing is a sin. As if it's, as if changing is something that you are always, you know, there's a consequence for it. But then I tell them, well, if you don't grow and change and evolve, what type of human? You're not, you're not a normal human. Normal people change. You know, what you believed in today, you have to have the audacity and the guts to say to yourself, okay, I believed in X yesterday and I am admitting I was wrong and I'm going to believe in today. I'm not a hypocrite, but I've learned more information and I've I've come to the conclusion that maybe I hadn't seen the same picture as everyone else. So I don't find that a sin. I don't find that hypocritical. I find that as growing and evolving, which a lot of people don't like. But that is so important that we accept that and it can be so hard. There is a, a statement from the dean of Harvard University in medicine and he said in 1956, he said to his students, whatever we teach you today, in 10 years, half of it will be obsolete. So be aware of that. Now, nowadays, uh, that is still true, but we are not talking 10 years. We're talking five years or even less. So mm -hmm. change is constant. And it is so hard for us because as humans, we want to have the security. We want to have the, the knowledge that everything is going to be all right. And inevitably, uh, there will be spanners in the works. And for many of us, that's so hard to accept. For many of us, we're, we're holding on to white knuckling, trying to somehow turn back the wheel of time. No, 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 I don't want this new, new reality to be true because I, I was actually very happy in my old life. But these things will occur and these things will, will challenge you. I think you are in a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, trajectory of growth because 
you were forced to deal with change. You were forced to reinvent yourself. You were forced to look at yourself in the hot, cold uh, light of the day and learn about yourself, learn about your emotions, learn about your core beliefs, learn about your actions and take responsibility of these actions. That is a gift. And many of us don't recognize it, but you have grown and I, I love to hear that. So who will be the Mariam in three months time, in a year time? Who do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, that's a good question. I, I definitely don't want to be this Mariam, this version. I don't, I'm not liking this version a lot. <laughs> it's still very susceptible to criticism. I, I'm a very big empath and a recovering empath at that as well. So I'm still, you know, I think I'm still pulled a little bit back by and affected as, as we all are. We are all human. No one can say that, you know, whatever people say doesn't affect them. That's that's absolutely a lie. We all, to some degree, take into consideration what people are telling us, their feedback. Now, you'd, as they say, you are the average of five of who you stay with. So I'm really now very conscious of whose opinions and uh, whose feedback I receive or allow to receive. Mm -hmm. I listen to everyone respectively, but I no longer take everything on board. I, I've put filters and barriers up and only allow, and I look at who's telling me this stuff anyway. Have you done what I'm hoping to get to? If the answer is no, I still listen to you, but it zones out. You know, you know, the other day I, I, I heard something that really struck with me. It takes two years for a child to learn to talk and then 60 years to learn to be silent. And how true is that? That's true. <laughs> so I've, I've done more listening now. And the more I listen, the more I see if that, if that sort of, if that, mm. if you can sort of picture that, the more you listen in, now, instead of looking at people, I listen to them and look at their actions, the more the clearer I've become to see. Um, and in, in, you know, even in three months time, I'm hoping that, you know, the new changes that I'm doing, the new places that I'm going, I'm heading to London next week uh, to speak at the Women's Changing the World Summit. I'm actually a finalist, uh, which is hosted by the Duchess Sarah Ferguson. So that, that person that's going there, that Mariam that's going to get go there and then go to Paris and do everything and see the speaking that I'm doing, would never have dreamt that the Mariam last year would even get there. Um, it's, it's, I think, just a huge change for me in, in where I want to go. It's very big. Beautiful. You're exposing yourself. You take small actions every day to get stronger. You are reviewing your actions to see if they were leading you into the right direction of your moral compass. Yeah. But you mm -hmm. stayed consistent. You took one step and next step and next step and never giving up. And I think that is the, the secret to not surviving, but thriving. To actually Absolutely. figure out who do we want to be and turn that from a vague dream into a vision. A vision is crystal clear. And you know exactly who you want to be. You know exactly, let's say, your weight, your strength, your ability to talk, your whatever it is that is important to you at that moment in time. If you can be crystal clear to it and then create smart goals and take a small, tiny bit of baby steps, but consistent baby steps every day without fail, that's how you change. And that's what you are doing. Wow. Mariam, wow. Congratulations of being the finalist. And congratulations on your trip to the UK. Please say hello to Sarah. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that alone will make you grow. But it's it's that's the accumulation of many, many dark moments. How many dark nights of the soul were there to bring you to this moment? So many. I don't think those dark moments have really left me. 
Mm. Um, I, I, I don't think you can ever really recover from your past. I, at least personally, I don't believe that. You know, I, I've been to psychologists. I've been, I've done, I'm doing the inner work. I'm emotionally intelligent now in hindsight. I, I, I know what, you know, my buttons are. I'm very aware of, you know, what affects me and what doesn't. But like a lot of people, we live, we revisit the past so much because we're ashamed of you know, the mistakes we've done. We're ashamed yeah. of the decisions we made. Every yeah. day I think of something that I've done and say, how, 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 how stupid were you? But then, then logic comes in and says, but that's not you anymore. And a lot of people, at least because, you know, since I've done business coaching and interacted a lot more with people over the last couple of years in, in the e-com world and online with social media, we all share the same thing. We've got this as if embarrassment that, but I've made so much mistakes. Can I really change? Can I, can I really, you know, move forward? Absolutely you can. I, I believe God's giving you a breath every day. Every day is a new page. And I always say, you probably didn't, not probably for sure, we didn't get a chance to write the start of our story. We didn't We didn't choose our parents. We didn't choose our religion. We didn't mm. choose our ethnicity, you know, our, our financial status when we were born. We had no say in that. But we can absolutely choose a spectacular ending for ourselves because we're the authors of our own books. Mm. We are the authors and the narrators of every damn single chapter. Mm. And and I don't understand why I have to give my book to people to write in it. And I can rip those pages out now and say, you know what? I don't want this chapter anymore. I don't identify with that. It's ripped. It's going into the bin. I'm starting fresh tomorrow or today or whenever it is. And and my book is my book. It's none of anyone else's business to go back into my chapters and pull out chunks of things to use it against me. I no longer allow that anymore. And I hope everyone else doesn't. Yet, at the same token, we need to take ownership of who we were in the past. But yes. we also have the privilege and the right to point out, actually, that was Stefan in the past. These were the mistakes that he has made. And yes, he regrets them. And yes, he's trying to make amends. But also, the person that you're now talking to is a different version. So please let me reintroduce myself. Um, it is probably a nice way of looking at it. Okay. Yes, you summed it up nicely. Absolutely, as you just said, you know, every single time I reintroduce myself to myself, even because sometimes your own self, you're like, but didn't you just think of this yesterday? And then you have to, you know, and this is an internal dialogue. But no, hang on, I, I don't anymore. Yes, I did, but now we're we're a new version of ourselves. And this is where it gets hard. And I can, let's not be philosophical. Back to the real world, the reality. We all have families and partners, and and you know, colleagues and extended. It gets really hard for the people around us to try and keep up. And <laughs> and what makes it even more difficult is if our own spouses and families are not on the same journey as us. They're not on par with us. This is when the clashes start to happen mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they don't understand you. Every time you're a new, you know, you're shedding your skin and you're someone else and they just can't keep up. So it, it's very, it's very difficult. It's not something, it sounds nice in words, but in reality, it's, it's a, a struggle and a fight every single day uh, to be able to move forward. The resistance is huge. But also the insights are huge. The, the, I'm so grateful for that. Yesterday, my, my I spoke to my son over the phone and he is going through a hard time. So he ranted and raved. And there were some words that maybe a year ago I would have taken rather personal and I would have rather maybe felt hurt for maybe reasons of insecurity or reasons of guilt and shame from the past. Yesterday, there was not a single, single negative emotion there. And I saw it for what it was. He needed to let off steam. He needed to get it out. And that was beautiful. So that growth that I had experienced there, the realization that I was able to be there for him mm. without reservation and not being sidetracked by wrong perceptions, misunderstandings, my past, that was huge. And afterwards, mm. I had a smile on my face and thought, wow, okay, you have come a long way. And this is beautiful. This is, these are the things that, that we all can aspire to. But it is a, a journey. 
you have gone through a, a, a long meandering uh, journey, a long path that was hard and often enough you stumbled. And that is normal. And we we just need to accept that. But please, guys out there, if there is one thing that you can learn from both Mir uh, Mariam and me is that there is hope. Mm. That there is, that the past does not equal the future. We can make tremendous differences by taking small but consistent steps every day and work on us. And suddenly there is a fulfillment there. And suddenly you know why you're getting up in the morning and you're actually intrigued and you want to wake up earlier and want to kiss this morning. Hello. And it is beautiful. Mariam, you're an amazing woman. And I so wish you all the energy to continue to grow, to continue to prosper, to continue to blossom. It is fantastic. Uh, Mariam, if, if people want to know more about you, where can they find you? Um, I sort of live on Instagram. I'm everywhere but on Instagram. So if you go to mariam.alhuli uh, on LinkedIn, the same, uh, or www.mariamalhuli.com, which will take you to my LinkedIn and I, you know, hope to connect. And if you are coming from this podcast, drop me a DM and say hello. And would love to know your feedback. Mm. And you know, I hope you take everything on board with a grain of salt. Uh, as I say always, listen to everything in this world with a grain of salt. Yes. Nothing is ever set in stone. There is never a right and a wrong. You know, each mm. to their own. Um, and I hope that you know I've put something into you or some hope that tomorrow is going to be a better day. Brilliant. Guys, look down there into the description of the YouTube video and of the podcast. All of Mariam's details are down there. Please press the like and subscribe button whilst you're down there. And uh, tell your friends about this show because we are here to make this world a better place. Uh, thank you so much, Mariam. This was a fantastic show. I wish you all the best for the future, okay? Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. And you guys out there, look after yourself and live with intention. Bye. I never give up. I never give up, I never give up, turn around.